Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to start off by showing you this, the images on this presentation board. I created this board using different images uh, that my dad had from World War II. Uh, this is the certificate or a copy of the certificate that he uh, got when, when soldiers cross the equator for the very first time. They, are issued, they go through a hazing process, and that means, in Daddy's example, he had a head full of hair, but his reward for crossing the equator, they took a razor, and they chopped chunks of hair off his head, so he had bald spots all around his head. Okay? The officers were beaten on their back with a wet towel. That was their reward. And so he was issued a large certificate, and I have it hanging up in my living room, uh, of this, it's called King Neptune Holding Court. And he is the king of the royal domain, you know, Davy Jones and all that thing. And then so from there, when they crossed the equator, they went directly to Australia. And I have some Australian souvenirs, some money. A tramway ticket from the town of Brisbane, a beer label, and a stamp from Australia. From there they went to New Guinea, and here is a New Guinea armband that he, uh, that he got, and here's a picture of me with the armband around my wrist right here. It's normally supposed to go around your bicep, but those guys are so skinny, uh, it could only fit up to here on me. Here's a logo of his battalion, and here's a Christmas card. Here's a picture of my dad next to a P-38 fighter plane. And what's interesting to me about this is that this may be the last picture ever taken of this plane because it was shot down 11 days later. Wow. Here is a picture of the New Guinea militia being trained. Uh, some scenery of some palm trees and the ocean. And here, from there, they went to the Philippines. And the Philippines, the Japanese had taken over the Philippines right after Pearl, Pearl Harbor. The next day, they invaded the Philippines. And so they had control of the Philippines about two years. And they issued their own money, their own currency, paper money. And it's like that wide. And so the people in the Philippines called it Mickey Mouse money. And so I have a 10 centavos and a 1 centavo. Here's pictures of uh, school teachers in the town of uh, Giwan in the uh, eastern Samar. Here's a photograph of me holding my dad's uh, Japanese rifle that he found in the Philippines. This is a, a, an Arasaka rifle and the bayonet I'm holding in my hand. Here's a picture of one of the, the uh, Philippines Liberation Ribbon, which is on that uh, uh, shadow box there. Here's three pictures of Japanese planes that were shot down. And then over here on this side, if you've never seen a picture of a, or seen a regular uh, authentic telegram. I have a copy of a telegram right here with the envelope it came in that when my dad got back from the war and he got back to the United States, landed in San Francisco, he went directly to Western Union and sent that telegram and I'll read it for you. To Mrs. C. N. Bertrand, arrived safely Expect to see you soon. Don't attempt to contact or write me here. Love, Curtis. And there's the date, and there's a three cent stamp on the envelope, and the stamp is uh, November 23rd, 1945. He was told of his release. Let me, let me rephrase that. He was told while he was in Manila that there would be leaving to go back home on November 4th. So 
They got on the ship. I don't know how long it took to get all everything ready and get on the ship. But from the time that he was told on November 4th to the time that he sent the telegram, it's about 20 days, three weeks. And so here is a photo of five first cousins. And that's my dad right here. And uh, some of these had a higher rank of, say, officer. And uh, my dad was a, a specialist uh, te technician fifth grade. And here are some patches that were on his uniform. And uh, the same article uh, from the Daily World newspaper and his dis honorable discharge uh, card. All right, so what I'd like to do, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation that will take you around the world like he went from home to war and back. And what I did, I took his 600 pictures that he came home with, I sorted them out, I organized them, and I organized them by month. That way, using the information on the back of the photo, which normally had the, the month and the year, and sometimes the, the country he was in, I used that, I created a timeline so that I was able to trace his steps on a month-by-month -month basis from home to war and back home. I don't know if that has ever been done before, but I was crazy enough to attempt this monumental task and talk about a task. It took a lot of effort. And I was so glad when this book was done, I could move on with my life. So this is my dad at age 65. Um, and I'm age 64, so I don't know if you can tell the resemblance or not. Alright, so let's move on. Alright, so it starts out, this is where he grew up. West of Opelousas, on Highway 103, is a little community called Mallet. That's where he grew up. That's where his daddy built a home. They had a huge farm. And they had property around the area. So he starts off in, from Malik. And from there he goes straight north to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. To boot camp. He stays in boot camp probably a month maybe. Maybe five weeks. And from there he goes to Geiger Field, Washington. Which is... Uh, a military base just on the outskirts of Spokane, Washington, which as you can tell is real close to Idaho. They were there to learn their task, their job that they were to do in the Army. He, was, he belonged to the 863rd Engineer Aviation Battalion. This was in the Army Air Force. The Army Air Corps changed their name to Army Air Force in 1942. So he stayed there several weeks learning how to do his job, which was uh, maintenance of the heavy equipment. They needed to do their job, which was to create roads, to create airfields, airports, uh, buildings, and they had carpenters, they had their own carpenter unit, they had their own sawmill, as we'll see later. So, I asked him what he did, and he said, Well, I oiled and greased and changed the oil and the bulldozers and the graders and the machinery that they needed to operate uh, and build these airstrips. So, after Geiger Field, they take a train down south to San Francisco, they spend the night in Camp Stoneman, which is just outside of San Francisco, and they were all bused to the uh, bay, at San Francisco Bay, to take a ship. And I have a picture of that ship in the book. 
By the way, I took his pictures and photos of his artifacts and souvenirs, and I put them in this book here. That's War Photos, Adventures in the South Pacific. And there are also 14 chapters of airplanes that he, uh, 14 different kinds of airplanes that he took. So, so here he is, he's a 22 year old country boy. And he had graduated at that time in 1937, he graduated high school, and at that time there was only 11 grades. The 12th grade was added later. So he graduated high school by graduating from the 11th grade, and then he went to LSU, and he enrolled in the ROTC, and so... Uh, I guess that was a big thing for a country boy to go from Mali to Baton Rouge. And so here he is, he's on a trip to around the world. What emotions did he feel? You know, I, fear, just think of the fear. You're on a ship and you're watching the, the soldiers uh, install 30 caliber machine guns all around the ship so that they would be protected from enemy aircraft. Fear is in when they were approaching, when they had crossed the equator and were approaching Australia, a submarine was spotted. Well, what does that do for you? You think, well, am I going to die? Are they going to torpedo my ship and uh, my ship sink and die before you even get into the war? And then I told you about the hazing ceremony, the King Neptune uh, deal. So, Will I get injured? Will I die? What's going to happen to me? So, their first stop is in Sydney, Australia. <clears throat> so, they go from Sydney on to the next town above, and then there's three towns in a row, as you will see, but you can see the relationship of New Guinea to Australia. And so, he's going to, his next country that he's gone to is New Guinea. But in Australia, they after they get settled in, they have time to sightsee, and he goes to the zoo with his buddies, and this is one of the pictures of the animals that uh, he took, kangaroo, and on the right is a car uh, with a special attachment on the back. And any clue what that is for? It burned charcoal. Ma'am? Did it burn charcoal? Yes. That was a method. It's a coal burning car. You dump your charcoal or your coal into that attachment in the back and it creates steam and your car runs on the steam. Wow. All right. So here we see, first he went down to Sydney, Australia. They stayed there a couple of weeks. And then they moved up to Brisbane, which was the headquarters of General Douglas MacArthur. Now, if you can imagine, the whole western part of, well, the whole Pacific, for them to get organized and get everything in order, all of that came together in Australia. And so it was stepping stones from Sydney to Brisbane. From Brisbane, they moved up north to Townsville. And all of these different battalions were coming in from across the ocean uh, to serve a purpose for the war effort. From Brisbane, or uh, from Townsville, they jumped across the Pacific Ocean to the southern part of New Guinea, and they landed at Oro Bay. Okay, then Oro Bay, their job there was to create airdromes. That's an old-fashioned word for airstrips, airports. Okay? 
And so that whole section around Oro Bay, uh, that was the town or the, the area called Dovadura. So the Dovadura aerodromes were their specific task that they had to create. So you see, you have Haranda, North Boreo, South Boreo, and East Envy. Those names were villages in that area that they created airstrips in. And they were all very close together. And all of this was done with the enemy in the area. And so here is work done at the airdromes. There was a lot of dirt work. They had bulldozers, they had graders, they had packing rollers, uh, and dump trucks and cranes. And so here's a dump truck on the left with a load of rock. And so they picked the dump truck up with a crane to dump the gravel and rock out of the bed of the dump truck. On the right is my dad's friend Bill Habits from Ragley, Louisiana, which is about 30 miles, 20, 30 miles north of Lake Charles. And his operation, his specialty was bulldozer operator because he had a rice farm in Ragley and he operated a bulldozer on his rice farm. So the Army takes information that you already know and uses it to the benefit of the Army to do their job. Uh, like they asked my dad, well, what do you know how to do? Well, I'm a farmer. I know how to change uh, oil and, and grease my tractor, and my car, and all that thing. And said, good enough, you're in. We put you in the motor pool where you can take care of the heavy equipment. All right, so you in an Army Aviation Battalion. Well, aviation gives you a clue that you're dealing with airplanes. And so when you have, say, 100 airplanes on your, in your area, and not all 100 will be flying at the same time, you will need a place to park your airplanes. So where, where do you park 100 airplanes? Well, their, their job, part of their job was making airstrip runways and taxiways that required dirt work, such as draining swamps. What you do when you get to a swamp that's been there 4,000 years? Okay, well, you have to drain the swamp. You have TNT and dynamite to blast hills to create the gravel for, to use on the runways. And you, you, you do all your dirt work, you pack everything, you smooth it all down, then you, uh, so you make airplane parking lots, all right? And this is an official document, an official uh, scan, I guess you could say, that the officers had of one of the airdrome parking lots. Now it looks like a zipper, but all those black dots is a parking lot. Okay, so you have the parking lot next to a taxiway that leads to that bottom black strip at the very bottom. That's the runway. Well, why don't you just make really nice straight parking areas so you don't have all these curves? That's what the Japanese would say. Why don't you put all your planes in a row so we can come and fly one pass and destroy all 100 airplanes? Please do that first. No. They, they did it this way on purpose. They had the curve, the curviness uh, for a reason so that, that exactly what I just said would not happen. So they were protecting their planes. You have your, your whole area packed and it's smooth. The next step 
is you lay pierced steel planking. These are 10 foot long strips and they clip together one to the other. And so you can see they're, they're doing that right here. And another name for that material is called Marston matting. That was named after the guy who invented this process. And that company is still in business. Here is a finished runway. Uh, this one's probably four or five thousand feet long. The longest one they did was seven thousand feet long on the island of Biak, which we'll get to in a minute. All right, so you have a parking spot. Well, what do you do with that? Well, you have big old huge rocks that they put as a base. Then they put gravel on top of that to make a good foundation. Then you put your dirt back on top of, of all that. You smooth it and you pack it. These, and then you build a levee, what we know as a levee, around that parking spot, which is probably 20 foot high and maybe 20 foot wide, so that if an enemy plane happens to drop a bomb on your plane, and your bomb explodes and catches on fire and shoots debris all over. That levee acts as a barrier to prevent any debris or fire or burning objects to hit your plane and have a chain reaction. Because if it wouldn't be for that, you'd have a chain reaction and lose your whole airfield in a matter of minutes. So here we have bulldozers pulling what is known as a a scraper, uh, a scraper dirt pan where they, they shave the, um, the dirt and it all collects in that big hopper in the back of it. And uh, they call it, the military term was revetment. Revetment is what we would know as a levee or a barrier. Here is a, a, a soldier Packing uh, one of those parking lots. <coughs> this is taken at night in Dobadura, New Guinea. There was a red alert. <coughs> Some Japanese planes were spotted coming in, and so they started shooting at the planes with anti aircraft cannons anti-aircraft guns and the, these streaks in the sky are the tracers shooting so that the soldier would know how where their bullet is being uh, aimed and there's about I think I counted three different uh, anti-aircraft positions because there's three different angles that they're shooting from now Daddy told me a story. I said, did you have any close calls? Were you ever injured or hit or so on? And he told me the story of when he and his bunk mate, they, they, they set up tents. So there was two men per tent. And you have two little cots underneath that tent with about a two or three foot space in between each of uh, the two bunks. One night, on a night like this, a chunk of airplane came flying through their tent and landed in the dirt between the two cots. If that would have hit one of them, they would have been smashed, killed. Another time was when he was on the island of Biak and he was running for his life. The Japanese were shooting at them and he escaped without getting hurt. But when he got back to safety, he was looking to see, am I bleeding or anything? And he noticed a bullet hole through his pants leg. Just missed his leg. All right. So from Dobadura, New Guinea, they all get on a ship. 800 people in his battalion all fit on one ship. And they go up to Sadar, New Guinea. And the point of that trip was 
the Japanese were moving north. They were going from the Dobadura area where they were, they were going north and MacArthur issued an order that he wanted those Japanese to be killed. Okay? Don't let them escape. And where, see where the word New Guinea is? Right there is a mountain range. And the Japanese had to go cross through those mountains and a lot of them died from exposure to the, the ice and snow uh, in that mountain range. And on the top right you'll see New Britain Island with the town of Robal. That was a major, huge Japanese military base with airplanes and ships. And MacArthur says, we're not going to go fight against that town. We're going to circle it. We're going to blockade that whole area so no ships can get in or out. In other words, we want to starve them to death. That way, we don't waste U.S. GIs on this huge, big old operation. And so that was called Operation Cartwheel. We make a big wheel, a big circle around that whole area. So that was the operation my dad and his battalion were involved in. Okay, so they go to Sadar. And what do you do when you have to get from one part of the area to another part, but there's a river in your way? You have a portable bridge. Actually, this bridge comes in a kit, a huge kit that all of these soldiers uh, have put the bridge together. You see, the bridge is resting on that log platform that's called an abutment. They had to create that first on both ends, then set the bridge up and screw it all together. And the final end product, you'll have a bridge that can hold 10 tons of weight. So that H10 stands for it can hold 10 tons. And to give you a size comparison, on the end of the bridge, you see that truck there? And then along the side of the river, there's another truck there. So it gives you an idea of uh, the size. Where did these timbers come from? What are you going to do? Call the lumber yard? Yes, you call the lumber yard, you call the sawmill, and we say, we need a bridge that's going to be so many feet long, we need X number of beams so long and so wide, and so they, the sawmill cut the timber to specifications, and so they built this bridge over that ravine. Here's the sawmill. <clears throat> the way this works, you start from the far left. It may be kind of hard to see, but those men standing there, on the far left, they're standing next to the truck that the trees were put in. They go down to the forest, they cut the trees down, put them in the truck. They winch them out, because that pole, on the very far left, there's a winch chain next, uh, hooked onto that. And they winch the logs out, put them on this uh, log platform where you can roll the logs. And you'll see right here, and this picture's in the book, but you have, here's a saw, um, here's a, a, a big long tree, and here's the saw blade, a big circular saw blade. And there's a bunch of natives underneath here taking a break. <laughs> And imagine doing all that without earmuffs or earplugs. Here they are. This is the starting process. They're cutting this tree down. And they had to build a platform to get high enough to, to catch the, uh, the, the wood rather than sawing through 10 foot of empty hollow log or whatever. And this is a size comparison between my dad, who was six foot tall, and the New Guinea workers. 
and he is holding a Thompson submachine gun. When these natives were out there in the wilderness, in the jungle, cutting trees down, they had to be protected from Japanese troops that may be hiding in the area and wanted to kill. And so they had to have an office, uh, a, a soldier there to protect the natives. From Sador, they get back on the ship and they go to the island of Biak. The island of Biak is where they had the most intense fighting of the whole, of my dad's whole three years. That my dad was, uh, you could say, the closest to getting killed. Here's the island of Biak, and their goal was to go to the Mokmer Airdrome. There were three airdromes in that area, but they were tasked with being stationed in, at Mokmer. Now, the Japanese had invaded Biak two years before. They were there for two years. They had set up camp. They were very well organized. If you see this... Uh, that jagged line, a curved line, it says, Coastal Cliffs and Caves. There was a plateau. Of course, the beach would be at sea level. But there was a, a, a plateau that rose up to 200 foot in height. 200 feet is the size of a 20-story building. And so the advantage that the Japanese had was they set up camp, they set up their artillery on top of this 200 foot plateau and they had cannons and pillboxes and so they had enough ammunition to do damage. So as my dad's battalion was approaching by ship there were cannons being fired down from that plateau and trying to do as much damage as they could, but thankfully they were not very good shots. But when the ship, uh, they, the ship could only go so far, then there was coral obstructions, okay? Then they had to walk the rest of the way, probably four or five hundred feet with their gun and their pack, kind of like you would remember from Saving Private Ryan. Well, what happened as they were climbing down the rope ladder off the side of the ship, uh, there was a shell, a cannon shell landed nearby. It hit the coral under the water. The coral exploded like shrapnel and bullets and injured two of the men climbing down that rope ladder. Daddy was not hurt. And in those in that 200 foot rise of the plateau, there were caves all through there where the Japanese had settled in with their mortars and their machine guns and rifles, taking pot shots at the people coming in. Here, is, uh, here are two vehicles. On the left is they call a Duck W, which is a six wheel uh, v, uh, personnel carrier made uh, by General Motors Corporation. On the bottom is what they call buffaloes. These were tracked vehicles. Tracked like a tank. Tank tra tracks. When they approached, okay, before Daddy's Battalion approached Biak, about a week before, the infantry came in first to deal with the Japanese threat. And the Japanese had driven their tanks out into the ocean uh, where like at low tide there was just a little bit of water. Well, they, they drove their tanks out there to do as much damage as, as they could to the ships coming in. But the ships, as you can see, destroyed two of these tanks. The one on the right blew the whole turret off the top. And on the, on the one on the left you can still see the turret there. Do I need to move that cursor, Dad? Okay. Here is what is called a pillbox. 
Now, when we see the movie Saving Private Ryan, when you see on top of the hill those big concrete fortifications with cannons sticking through it in the movie Saving Private Ryan, well, there was no concrete plant on the island of Biak, so they had to make do with coconut logs. And so the daddy took this picture, and it looks like they had been there for a while. The Japanese had set up camp. They had the stoves and stuff, trash cans and whatever. Here's one of the Japanese cannons that was shooting at the, 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 my dad's battalion. And so this was destroyed by the American troops. Here's a Japanese bomb dump. They were ready for, ready for war. Now, <clears throat> when what happened was they were fed up with the Japanese on the top of the plateau shooting down at them, so they formed a battalion. And there was a lieutenant with the last name of Chasson, which to us is a good Cajun name. Well, Lieutenant Chasson uh, took a, a group of people with him, a group of soldiers, with some explosives, and they went up there on top of that plateau and destroyed the pillboxes and cannons and what have you. And there was a, a lot of you know, shooting going on, and they uh, killed the people in, in charge of that truck right here. And what the soldiers like to do is have some fun with the, or the equipment they capture, like this truck. And one of the guys took a paintbrush and a can of paint, and he painted on the side of that door, Tojo's Miscarriage. And Tojo was the head of the military uh, dealing with this area of the Pacific. And under miscarriage, you see the words, so sorry, please, which is what uh, the soldiers uh, mocked the Japanese accent by writing those words, sorry is S-O-L-L-Y, instead of sorry. All right. That's a truck that has been shot up. We went through some battle. That is an Australian soldier. You can tell by his hat. They, they wear that hat in a cocked way like that, holding his rifles and resting on the running board of that truck. Here's a, uh, a guy. <clears throat> Does anybody know who the guy in the middle is with that hat? Take a guess. This is an American entertainer who was there on the island of Biak doing a USO show, Bob Hope. So Bob Hope is signing autographs. My dad took that picture so you can see how close he came to Bob Hope. He said, did you get an autograph? Nah, wasn't interested. Here's Bob Hope's plane, and he had a huge entourage. Uh, we have a lot of the soldiers there mingling among the, uh, the entertainers. So he uh, was on the island of Biak. Okay, now it's getting ready. To, you have to leave one place and go to the next place. So here they loading up this LST, and what I find amazing about this is that you see them driving that vehicle into the mouth of that LST. And they, all of the equipment was stored on the top of the ship. So how do you get from the bottom mouth part of that ship to the top? They had an elevator. So you drive your, your bulldozer or what have you, and you're sitting on top of that elevator, they press a button, the elevator rises to the top, and you drive off to your designated parking spot. All right, so they leave the island of Biak, and they go to the Philippine Islands. And so their first stop is Calicoan Island in the, in the province of Eastern Samar. 
And you can see Kalapuan Island right there on the right. And they are there to do a favor for the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy needed to do some work there, and they needed that beach road along the side of the island. The, uh, they needed a beach road made. And so the problem was there was huge mounds of coral in the way. So they asked the engineers to come in and blow up the coral and uh, make a road along that edge of that island. And they did that. And uh, can you imagine a little country boy, 22, 23 years old at this time, getting to see things blow it up. Let's set this stuff on fire and blow it up. So uh, he, that was one of his adventures. And their next step, they leave Calicoan Island, they go to San Pedro Bay, they spend the night there on the ship, they mail, they go do a mail run, they get all that mail that was collected for them, and whenever they got mail, their morale skyrocketed. And the, the officers made a note of that. All through the book, you'll see uh, what's written in what looks like typewriter type is the actual officer's journal of what they have to report. And they said, we got our mail today. Morale is up 100%. So the next morning they leave, they go through that little channel there, and they're on their way to a battle in the northern part of uh, the Philippine Islands, uh, northern Luzon. You see north, you see that the very, very top where it says Luzon, and you have a little bay there, a little cut. That's the Lingayen Gulf. So there's a battle going on in the Lingayen Gulf where there's a battle in progress. And what's happening is the Americans are invading. The Japanese don't like that. So they send their air force to bomb the ships that are arriving. And if that doesn't work, then you're, the pilot, the Japanese pilot, was commanded to fly his plane into the ship. And that's where the term kamikaze pilot comes from. And it was what we would call a suicide bomb. And the landing zone where they had to land was 20 miles wide. Now, if, if you're familiar with the Atchafalaya Basin, uh, I-10 going over Atchafalaya Basin, that's 18 miles wide, the, that bridge. So this landing zone where the arrow is pointing, that's 20 miles wide where all of the ships came in and they unloaded their supplies, their equipment, their tanks, <coughs> and everything that they had to unload, and then they had a huge, huge task of rebuilding the area. Lose, uh, the whole Philippine Islands was a U.S. protectorate. Okay, we had a, a financial obligation, the U.S. did, to protect the Philippines and restore what was damaged. And so when the Americans started invading, the, some of the Japanese uh, escaped and some were commanded just to hold your position. And, but the, the ones that escaped, what they did was they blew up every railroad bridge they could, every highway bridge. They blew up the, uh, the runway at Clark Field Airport outside of Manila just to be mean. And that slowed down the progress of the American uh, and, and allied work in the Philippines. So my dad's being belonging to an engineer battalion, they restored the bridges. They created new bridges, new highway bridges. They repaired the Clark Field runway. Now, inside of the city of Manila, which was very large, there was the original city created by the Spaniards in the 1500s. The Spaniards created a, a wall around their little 
uh, inner city, and my dad called it the walled city of Manila, that the Filipinos called it Intramuros, or, I don't know, inner, inner city maybe. But the Japanese ha that had remained and were commanded to stay and fight, they dug in and they hid and they found hiding places within the city, the walled city, and there were thousands of Japanese there with rifles and machine guns shooting at any American GI or allied soldier that moved. So the problem they had was how do we get through this walled city? Well, they brought in several 240 millimeter howitzer M1 cannons. Now, as you can tell, this thing, the cannon, the barrel on thing was, this thing was so long that he couldn't get it all in on a shot, in this shot. But believe me, it's very long, very powerful. This cannon could shoot a shell that weighed 350 pounds, 14 miles. A lot of power in that, in that cannon and in that shell. This was their supply dump. Now, when you are rebuilding all of these destroyed uh, loading docks along the, the uh, Manila Bay, with a lot of loading docks for their ships, a lot of these were completely destroyed and mangled. That was a, it needed a lot of supplies to create their job. This was the supply dump. You have mountains of wire and other things. On the back of this print, the daddy wrote, Need wire? Question mark. All right, so now in the back of the book, I've taken you from start to finish, from daddy's time where he grew up and over into the war and ending in the Philippines. He leaves the Philipp he gets word on November 4th, 1945, that it's time to leave. Of course, they dropped the bomb in August and September, I believe, a few months earlier. And so they had uh, September, October to play and do sightseeing. And uh, Daddy took pictures everywhere he went, he went, and I call that he left me a photographic breadcrumb trail that I could piece together his movements from start to finish. Well, in the back of the book, I have a section on just airplanes. He took 14 different types of aircraft, bombers, fighters, seaplanes, gliders, and so we have 14 chapters in the back dealing with the airplanes. I even have did some research to let you know uh, what type of motor, uh, what type of, um, how, how high they could tr uh, fly, how fast, if the propeller had uh, two blades or three or four blades. And then in the very back of the book, I have a section on the New Guinea natives. Uh, so he took uh, a lot of pictures of, of these New Guinea natives. And here I have my dad's metal shadow box that you can take a look at. I have what is called trench art. When you're in the trenches and you have time on your hands and you have the material, you can make stuff. So here, this is a plane uh, made out of a bullet casing. And so this was my toy when I was four years old and I wasn't too gentle with it. I was a uh, I was very serious with my flying plane, you know, you bomb things. And here I have his canteen, and my dad and I, when we would go work at the farm, would uh, fill this up with water, and we'd have water to drink. This was before we even learned about igloos or things of that nature, where you can fill up a big jug and take it with us. So that's what we used. Here's his belt that he brought back from the, from the war, 
You have a, a belt buckle here with an engraving. This is 1945, and it's a picture of the uh, palm trees and the ocean. And you can take a look at all of this here later. And so that concludes my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Very good. Good. All right. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. You forgot to tell us who that Jack is up there. Jack Vautier is my dad's friend from Opelousas. Jack was a pilot of that plane right there, the Hung Lo. It was a B-25 Mitchell bomber. And my dad was friends with him because Jack's father was a salesman for Church Point Wholesale Grocery Company. My dad's dad had a grocery store. So that's how they became friends. And Jack went to uh, Opelousas High School and he got shot down in that plane uh, in it's called the New Hebrides Islands, which is, wasn't too far from Biak. And Daddy took that really hard. He lost his best friend, well, one of his best friends. I asked my dad one time, Daddy, uh, did you lose any of your close friends in the war? And he said one word. He said, when? And I had a decision to make. Do I pursue this conversation or do I just drop it? And I dropped it. Because I didn't want to risk seeing Daddy cry. Yeah. Which I had already witnessed him crying when his brother died. And I have a tendency to cry whenever I see somebody else crying. Right. <laughs> and so I just dropped it and lo and behold I found out who Wynn was Wynn is in the book there's three or four pictures of him in the book here and <clears throat> so I have a story of what happened to him and so if you're interested in finding out this would be a great book for you to have uh, as I always say this makes a great book for you to read. So I say buy one for yourself and ten more for others. <laughs> as it is. Going back to the uh, your presentation for the layout on the tents for the for all. Well I have a couple Thank you. <clears throat> I have a couple more pictures here. Uh, here's a couple of New Guinea uh, men. One on the right is holding a little drum that they used in their celebrations. <clears throat> This one here, on the back of the uh, print, Daddy wrote, Fuzzy Wuzzy. <laughs> and as I was doing the research for this book, I found out that there, people like him were called Fuzzy Wuzzy Warriors. So it wasn't so much that he was mocking the Afro style, it was saying that this is a, one of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Warriors. Now, the importance of him and his people, they were considered heroes because they were stretcher bearers. They would go into the jungle where the fighting was, where the Japanese were fighting against the Allies, the Americans and the Australians, and when a soldier got wounded, instead of leaving him there to die, him and his partner picked up, put the soldier on the stretcher and carried him to safety through enemy gunfire. So I, I found them to be very, uh, very interesting soldiers in, in their own right. And here's a New Guinea native with a headdress. They are in the middle of a celebration. There's more pictures in the book of pictures of, of him and his... Uh, uh, people. Here is a photo Daddy took of some little boys. Uh, when you got to a certain age, you started wearing a grass skirt. 
Well, the little one in the middle was completely naked, and Daddy made his own grass skirt out of thread to cover him up. He didn't look too happy about that. <laughs> and uh, here I have at the end of this program what I call a little entertainment section. And I'm giving you the caption before I show you the photo, okay? So this caption I created says, before Google Maps, you did what you had to do. So you have to think, what is he talking about? Well, I'll show you. I don't know if you can see that from where you're at, but they are tattooed from head to toe. So it's like, well, look, you go down to this tree and you turn right. Alright, so the next one is, okay, I'm ready to clean the latrine now. Toby says, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Oh my goodness. There he is, he has gas mask and everything. He's good. Got his gun ready to kill any big tide that comes out of that latrine. And so uh, there's my website, and um, now I have some more here, but these are more rated R. <laughs> but if y'all can handle that, I'll, I'll proceed. Uh, the natives were great at making killer bongs, goat skin bras, not so much. Yeah. So. I don't know if that's really a bomb that she's smoking or, or what. Yeah, mm -hmm. smoking that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a, a you really took into consideration whether or not to put some of those pictures into your book. You must tell the story. Well, for those that were be uncomfortable seeing pictures. Yeah, I. Uh, I, with fear and trepidation, I put some pictures in there that were, we would consider risque. Uh, certainly in the 40s, it would be considered risque. Now, we're so immune to all of this junk that's on TV and, and movies. Um, but the, the New Guinea natives, the women were topless by custom. Right. And... Apparently, they had no problem nursing little animals. And so, that's what this one was. You want to see it or not? Hmm. Let me stand this. <laughs> no. I can, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, she's nursing two puppies. And you go, it's just like, wait a minute, you know. Well, yeah, but I can see why. Yeah. Uh, but it's like uh, the National Geographic were the first ones that I know See? that showed, you know, right. natives as in their state. Right. Well, I had the idea it's that... It's history, so, you know. I had the idea that I would like to get this book into high school and middle school libraries. And so I went to talk with the head of the library, uh, the school library system in Lafayette. And I showed him some of these pictures that were questionable, and he told me which ones that I should take out, and which, you know, which ones that he thought were okay. So that's still on my agenda to do, to do a re revised version, uh, not so shocking yeah. to young kids, because I have pictures in here of dead Japanese soldiers. Remember I told you in Biak, they were shooting down This is all that, true pictures, but to get into certain They were systems. shooting down from that plateau, and, and so well, they took that, uh, that squadron up there, and they wiped out all those people that were shooting at them. And so their pictures are in here. Uh, I have four pages of pictures uh, of dead Japanese soldiers that if and when I do that revised version, those would be coming out. Well, you should go to the school after you do. Uh, Kurt Isles uh, came, and he when he requested that when he came, he wanted to go to Carver City and not be fly to uh, encourage the kids in journaling. 
So uh, I'm sorry there aren't any teenagers here to learn about World War II. Right. Um, I know There's myself. One. There's one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean a whole well, bunch of them. It's yeah, like yeah, I go to the museum. 20 or 30 would be nice. <laughs> yeah, but it was like um, the museum downtown in Alley. The teacher said, you'll get credit if you attend the Kavanaugh lectures. Okay. And so, um, you know. But I know that Kurt had a real good response with the younger uh, kids in Carter C than he did with the high school uh, kids. Uh, you know. Is he an author? Yeah, he's from Dry Creek. He now lives in Alexandria. Um, Cook out. You know but he, it's like he wrote about the area around Dry Creek. Um, the one at Christmas time is Jam and Jellies, it's Christmas stories. He wrote. It's on the she's telling me. Yeah, he wrote um, a series and it's called Dry Creek Stories, I think. I think that is it, yeah. I think I remember looking something he up has a, from um, the notes I had taken. Yeah, he's also done missionary work in yeah. Africa. Oh, he spells his last name I S L E. I L. I S L E or something like that. He. Yes, I think. I think so. I think I looked it. Up. Anyway, we need to look yeah. at it. But he had he has a website. Um, but his last two books he wrote was. We had tried to get a hold of him to come back from the first time he came. Uh, I think he told told the story of Split Bullet. If you've not read that, you will find that interesting. But anyway, we couldn't get a hold of him because he was living with tribes doing his missionary work uh, in Africa, in mm -hmm. Sudan. And he, he and his wife uh, sold their house at Dry Creek and uh, went. And they came back, they bought a house in Alexandria uh, because seven grandchildren live in Alexandria. Okay. Do you remember me telling you about that lady that was so interesting that I would make an appointment to come back and drink some coffee and you said, you really do that, Sudi? That's her. Did that's, you really that's do that? Lady. Not yet. I told him about you oh, and okay. said you were so interesting that I'd like to come back, have coffee one day, and sit and just take notes. Well, Anne, Probably film everything you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, film it. Yeah. Anne has good coffee. I told him we need to make an appointment, have you sit down and just talk your heart out. Oh. On video. On video, that would be easier. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, you didn't have to worry. It would all work out. You have interesting, yes, that's, that's the lady right there. Is e yes. L S E. You said the lady. Ward. What? No. I-S-L-E. Uh, how, how do you spell Kurt? Kirk, K R K, Kirk or Kurt? C U R T. C U R T. Kirk. Yeah, he's a great author. So that Very would be the Nation Museum stuff. Uh, one of the books on the African Nation uh, is Travel Gang Grass, and yeah, that's because the yeah. elephants, yeah. when they meet, they just, you know, and so they trample all the grass. So that's the title of yes. one of his African books. It's called what? Trample. Grass. Travel grass. Yeah. You have to look him up. I remember I had a Well, there. if you want to come take a look at some souvenirs and close up look of this board available. They had to go into the caves. In the Philippines. Right. Well, you did what you had to do. Yeah, he was a little guy, and there's ways into caves, you know, other than the big entrance. Room. Okay. And that was that was his job. Kind of reminds me of the Vietnam War, where they had Lord sent Lord. these soldiers into the the caves, the tunnels. They call them tunnel rats. That's right. And they had booby traps, uh, dangerous things down in there. But 
talk about it takes some courage to go down into that environment where you know you could get injured or killed. Yeah, he was a, he was all the time around. Miss Janice, could we have you talk a little louder and tell us who you are? I think it's very important that my friends here know. Jeremy, can you turn the these on? How you're connected to this library? Because I okay. had a oh. sit down conversation with you when we came for my book signing, and would like to record who you are and how you are connected to this library. Okay. Well, um, I volunteer, uh, but we have the Friends of the Library, and I'm president of the Friends. And I'm Janet Ward. Yeah, that's right. That's the most important thing, because you share some good stories with me that are not written yet. Uh -huh. Okay, I wanted to kind of tell my friend the publisher here that you were telling me so many interesting stories, kind of like you narrated this kind of thing, but different things and areas. But I wanted to be sure that we had you down and film your name. Janice? Ward. Ward, W-A-R-D. Yeah, my husband was in the Air Force when the Korean, uh, they wore a radar uh, outfit, and uh, they came to, it wasn't uh, England at the time, it was Alexander Air Base, which had been during World War II, and then how the barracks were, uh, when they got there about Christmas time, were put in these barracks that had been turkey coops. And they couldn't scrub them, couldn't get that smell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> they had no um, real bathroom, they had latrine, and they were uh, fired by a little stove for the hot water. And uh, the guy burned down one of the retreats. And they uh, asked him, because you're only supposed to put two shovels of coal in that little stove. He says, I lost count. <laughs> there was one guy that had shoes that, when he took them off, they smelled coming to high heaven. And, uh, he evidently couldn't smell. So um, they decided to put sardines in those shoes. To make it smell better. Oh, no. <laughs> and he never noticed. <laughs> they went and bought him a new pair of boots. <laughs> uh, there was a guy that uh, they had to go up on a helicopter to know about the helicopter. He didn't have to operate it. Uh, but anyway, he said he wasn't getting his feet off the ground. So <clears throat> they put dirt in an apricot lug and put it in the floor of the helicopter and picked him up and sat him in there and placed his feet on the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and he went up. <laughs> so between all this serious business, people were having fun times then. Oh yeah, they were, they were all country boys. They were all farm boys. And uh, they knew how to, how to do things, and, uh, you know, they, they had a great camaraderie. <laughs>